Hi everyone, it's great to have all of you here on this Trinity Sunday. Today I'll be sharing with you, Come Thou Almighty King. Good morning. Welcome to Garden Street United Methodist Church. We are happy that you were with us this morning. It is May 30th. It is Trinity Sunday, and it is also Memorial Day weekend. And we, we, we're so happy that you're here. For those of us using a computer, we invite you to, to use the chat feature to greet one another. It's a wonderful way to stay in connection with one another. We also will have a Zoom fellowship hour immediately following the worship service, and the link for that is located right underneath your screen. It is also going to be at the very end of the worship service. As we prepare to sing our opening hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, I invite you to greet one another on the, with the chat feature, and to also, if you are worshiping with someone in person, to greet one another at this moment. It is time to worship together, my friends.
Good morning, church family. As we gather with one another, let us join together in our opening prayer. God of majesty and power, how awesome you are to us. The mountains tremble, the seas roar at the sound of your name. And yet you have chosen to come to us in love and tenderness. You call us to be people who act in ways of peace and justice in your world. And so open our hearts and our spirits to ministries of hope and peace for all your earth. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. Let us worship God. Mother, Father, Creator, Sovereign God, Maker of heaven and earth. Let us worship God. Jesus Christ, God with us, brother, friend. Let us worship God. Holy Spirit, a rushing wind, a still small voice. Surrounded by God's goodness, let us live with joy and hope. Did you know that Christians tend to think of God in three particular ways? Today we'll talk about these three parts to who God is. Have you heard the word Trinity before? If you haven't, can you help me out by guessing what it means? The tri at the beginning of Trinity sounds similar to the tri in triangle. Do you know what tri in triangle means? It means three. That's why we call the three parts of who God is the Trinity. Let's dive into each of these three aspects of God. I made a spinner to help us explore this. Let's try it out. Jesus. Jesus is the son of God who was born on this earth and taught many people about God through his ministry many years ago. He was a real person but entirely God himself, too. We read about Jesus and learn from his teachings in order to understand faith better. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is more abstract. The Spirit is present all around us, all the time. This is how God is really alive around us, within us and among us. We can feel the spirit and emotions, see the spirit in the goodness and connection of other people, or experience the presence of God through our senses. God, the father and mother. This might be the identity that you are most familiar with. God, the father or mother is who we think of as an all powerful God, the creator of the universe and someone who watches over everything on earth. God is big. Jesus was a human who helps us connect to God and the Holy Spirit allows us to experience God. The point of teaching you all of this is that with three big parts to God's identity, there are so many paths for each of us to connect with God. There are so many ways to have faith. Some people might be more drawn toward God, the Father or Mother, Jesus or the Holy Spirit. Also, this might change from day to day for a person. Maybe one day you connect more to God as a powerful creator who is present in everything. Like when you are thankful for all the good things God has given you, or you look outside at the beauty of nature. Then the next day, you feel that Jesus has helped you know God more deeply. Like on a Sunday morning, when you hear a story about Jesus and his value of serving your neighbor. Then the next day, you are filled up with the Holy Spirit, 
like when you get a warm, fuzzy feeling inside because someone has expressed love and care toward you. All ways of connecting with God are equally wonderful. That's what's so great about the Trinity. There are so many ways to know and experience faith, so faith can hold unique meaning for each and every person. I hope that you will be able to connect with God, whether as the Creator, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, or some combination of the three, in your own unique and meaningful way throughout your lifetime. I invite you to pray with me. You can repeat after me. Loving God, help us to know and experience you in many ways. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you were a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Word of God for the people of God. Whenever I encounter this passage of Scripture, a question always arises in me. How is God calling us to be born anew? Several years ago, a woman in one of my congregations talked with me about a book that she had just read. It was entitled, White Man Walking. 
She was deeply moved by this man's story of transformation, and she gave me a copy of the book she had purchased. When I read it, I enjoyed this book very much. It was written in 2003 by a Minneapolis businessman named Ward Brim. In this book, White Man Walking, Ward Brim describes how without any warning at all, his life was turned upside down. He said it all started when his pastor stopped him after church one day and asked him if he'd like to go to Africa. He might as well have asked me if I would have liked to have gone to the moon, Brim said. Seeing Brim's resistance, the pastor asked, Will you at least pray about it, Ward? Brim looked him straight in the eye and said, Arthur, you're the pastor. You pray about it. I'll think about it. Well, as the story goes, two months later, Ward Brim found himself at an airport with a ticket booked to Ethiopia. But there were more surprises ahead for him. When he finally met up with the group he would be traveling with, they were surrounded by a group of church ladies, is how he described them. They were there to send the group off. This isn't looking good, he thought. And just before they boarded the plane, the group decided to hold hands and create a circle around him and the rest of the people who were going to Africa right there in the airport waiting area. Brim said he prayed all right, but his prayer was that none of his clients or partners would walk by and see him surrounded by this prayer circle. Ward Brim was in Africa for 10 days on that first trip he took. And he writes that he has never been the same since. The moment I stepped onto African soil, he said, my life was altered. He saw a world that before had only existed for him as a set of statistics. In Ethiopia, he listened to surviving family members tell stories of loved ones lost during the years of famine. In Uganda, he saw people everywhere dying of AIDS. For the first time, the senselessness of people starving to death overwhelmed him. Brim's experience in Africa caused him to deconstruct the ways he had put his life together. As he writes in his book, everything he thought he knew about the world, about his life, and about his relationship with God was turned upside down. God seemed intensely close to Brim in Africa, much closer than back home. Back home, he thought, with all of our comfort and privileges, we are usually only able to see God when things fall apart. Now Brim was beginning to see God, to experience God everywhere. And he recalled an old saying, that sometimes God uses a pebble to get a person's attention. And if that doesn't work, sometimes a larger rock. And for those who refuse to pay attention, God resorts to a brick. Africa, he said, was my brick. Since that first trip in 1992, Brim has traveled to Africa many times, taking groups of business executives with him, showing them the experience he had discovered, showing them, not with his words, but with actions and what was going on around them, the God that he had come to know intimately. This is Minneapolis businessman Ward Brim's story here in this book, 
and it is a great one. I also believe it is the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, that upstanding Pharisee leader leader that Jesus encounters in the third chapter of John's Gospel, his career has gone well. He goes to the synagogue. He prays regularly. But for some reason, he has this feeling of restlessness. And he's restless enough with his life to slip out in the middle of the night to find this rabbi named Jesus. It's a really bizarre conversation, really. There's a lot of talk, but not much communication. Nicodemus leads off with, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. We know. You can almost hear the smug self-importance in Nicodemus' statement. After all, he's a ruler of the synagogue. I imagine Nicodemus knew that people who come to the synagogue are supposed to keep the rules, are supposed to be responsible, are supposed to live a good life, and that's about it. But Jesus blurts out, You have got to be born anew, which confuses Nicodemus. What does that mean? Nicodemus tries to understand what Jesus is saying. Taking Jesus literally, he asks, but how can anyone be born anew after having grown old? Can somebody really go back into their mother's womb and start over? And then Jesus confuses him more when he says, The wind blows where it chooses. You don't know where it comes from or where it is going. What kind of God is he talking about, Nicodemus wonders. Jesus uses two of the most uncontainable, uncontrollable events to talk about God. He talks about birth and wind. In both cases, something happens to you. We don't get ourselves born. A birthing process does it to us. We don't generate the wind. The wind drives us. Nicodemus cannot find God or the kingdom of God on his own. He has to start over to be born anew. He can't plan it, achieve it, or put it on his resume. It has to come from above, Jesus says, from beyond himself. This conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus is much like the brick that was thrown at Ward Brim, the one that he spoke of in his book. That was also the brick thrown at Nicodemus. God got his attention in a confusing exchange he would never forget. Now we aren't told what happened to Nicodemus after this night meeting. But something must have shifted somewhere because Nicodemus shows up two more times in John's Gospel. He is in the temple later when Jesus is accused by crowds demanding that he be arrested. One man stands up to defend him. It was Nicodemus. And when Jesus is dead and crucified, there is Nicodemus again, right beside him. This time he isn't there at night as a seeker, but as a disciple, helping to take Jesus' body away. My friends, whether it is a pebble, a rock, or a brick, God wants to get through to us. But that's not so easy when we are all so competent, so goal-oriented, and so efficient. It isn't easy for God to get some time on our calendar, to get our full attention, to get us to take a chance on a deeper, different life. I believe that deep down, most people would love to have God change their lives, but they either don't 
expect it can happen, or they're afraid that if change started to happen, it would ask too much of them. When God throws a brick, anything can happen. And as the scripture says, the wind blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The wind blows. The Spirit moves. People start getting born anew into living a new life. Metaphorically speaking, bricks are flying, my friends. God is trying to get our attention in more ways than we can even imagine. A financial crisis may be the brick in your life that it invites you to assess your priorities. Or maybe it's a personal crisis that sends you reeling into the hands of God. Or maybe it's an invitation at a school or a food bank that serves the most struggling children that opens a door just for you. Nicodemus was hit by a life-shattering conversation that didn't make any sense to him at the time. But slowly and gradually, a new way of seeing and thinking began to get through, and the wind of rebirth took over. And so this story makes me wonder, have any of you noticed God tossing pebbles your way lately? Or stones trying to get your attention? And maybe it feels that there is a brick coming at you right now. Our God is a restless God, a relentless God who is always seeking to be in relationship with us. God always desires for us to experience new life, sending the wind of rebirth and filling us anew. Now, I don't know what experience will allow God to get through to you. Maybe it's through a trip to Africa or to Haiti or someplace like that. Maybe it happens in a personal crisis that sends you reeling. Maybe it is through a conversation, through a book, through a friend, through a small group gathering, or a hymn that you sing. Whatever the experience is that opens you up and allows God to get through to you, there is something I know for certain. In order to really experience God's love, we have to let go, we have to make room, and then be ready to be born anew. But only this time with God at the very center. I know one other thing, too, that God wants you to loosen the firm grip that you have on your life, to open your hands and to open your eyes and to go where God calls you to go. And I'm not saying that has to be something big, enormous change. It may be something really small that has a huge impact on yourself or another human being. Ward Brim writes in this amazing little book, I pray that each of you will find your Africa. Whether your Africa is a faraway continent, or a need right here in the United States, or a need right here in Bellingham, Washington. My friends, maybe your Africa is in your longtime job or the decision to head off in a new direction. Wherever and whatever your Africa is, I ask you to remember, the wind blows where it chooses. 
You don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So once again, I ask you this question. Where is your Africa? Where and how is God calling you to serve and be born anew? Thanks be to God. Amen. My friends, would you please join me in singing? Mothering God, you gave me birth. We so appreciate your continued giving to the ministries of our church. It is so needed during this time. We have three ways we have offered for you to continue to be generous to your church. One is to have a bowl or basket in your home where you collect money. And we will have opportunity to bring that to the church and have it blessed. We also just simply send a check to the church office. And we have an online giving button as well located on our church website. My friends, would you please lift all your blessings and gifts to God with me as we pray together our prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, may every one of us carry forward the work to which you have called us to. Bless these gifts as they represent our commitment of time and energy to extend the gospel of love in a world so in need of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us take a moment of silent reflection as we prepare our hearts for prayer. Let us pray. Tender and loving God, as we gather this day to worship you, we honor this weekend as a time when we quietly remember those whom we have loved and held so dear and have died before us. The death of those we have dearly loved reminds us of how privileged we were to have been welcomed into their homes, and in some cases, welcomed into family. That honor is not lost on us, 
knowing that we have been blessed by that gracious acceptance. We were called upon to bring comfort where there was pain, to bring peace where there was anxiety, to bring assurance where there was loneliness and fear, and to offer hope where there seemed to be none. Confident of the strength and comfort that your love brings, we lift the concerns of our hearts to you now, and we name them for you. We think of our friends and our loved ones who have died with a sense of gratitude, and in so thinking, we honor them. For surely, just as we touch their bodies with our hands, they have touched our spirits and left an indelible mark. They taught us to be gracious even in times of personal discomfort. They have given us the gift of laughter that transcends tribulations. They shared treasured life stories that enable us to be a little wiser if we've listened. They have made us feel wanted and needed and important, and that is a rare gift in today's world. Most importantly, perhaps, they have allowed us to learn to give of ourselves more freely, to face the inevitable loss, to love a little deeper, a little better. And so it is with a sense of gratitude and love that we name for you the joys of our lives. Gracious God, in the risen Christ, you befriended the world. And so we ask you to guide those who provide safety and protection through military and other forms of public service, and especially bless the memory of all who have died for the cause of peace. Grant your peace and healing to all people who grieve the loss of those we have so dearly loved. As we pray to you now, the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing together now the hymn entitled, We Are Called.
My friends, I hope that you will join us in a few moments for our Zoom fellowship hour. And I invite you now to join together in our sending forth. God, who created you in his or her divine image, sends you forth today. We go forth, ready to reflect the presence of our Creator to everyone we meet. Jesus, who has redeemed you, has established the reign of God in our midst. We go forth to bring healing to the broken of the world. The Holy Spirit, who calls you to be God's people, goes with you to many places. We go to tear down walls that divide us and build lives of hope for all people. And now may the peace of the rolling waves, the peace of the silent mountains, the peace of the singing stars, and the deep, deep peace of the Prince of Peace be with you now and forever. Amen.